Hi, welcome to another episode of I Own a Business, where we focus on helping practice owners grow the practice of their dreams. I'm your host, Dr. Steve Vargo, and I have with me leadership expert, Dr. Michelle Johnston. And Michelle is author of a, a fantastic new book that I actually just finished, The Seismic Shift in Leadership. She's also a management professor, executive coach, and leadership expert, helping leaders achieve results through meaningful connections. And that's something we're going to focus on in, in this discussion is connection and, and communication in the workplace and the link between effective communication and an engaged staff. And, and not only an engaged staff, but better financial performance as well. This, this all ties together. So, so happy to have you, Michelle. How are you? Oh, thank you so much, Steve, for having me. I'm great. You know, you already brought up a really interesting point that I've been pondering for years is I have my PhD in communication, right? And then I wrote a book on the importance of connection right now for leaders. And I've realized to me, in my humble opinion, communication and connection are two different things. Communication is much more how I view it now as the, as the transactional kind of old model of just getting information from point A to point B connection, people think, oh, yeah, 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 I'm good at it. And, and, and yet that's everything. Connection is much more than communication. To me, it's, are your people seen, heard, valued, appreciated? And that takes intention. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today. It is. And it's a great point. We all communicate. And, you know, in my role, working with other practice owners, the doctors, the managers, everyone communicates, but not everyone connects. Not everyone is equally effective at making that that human connection. It's it's a great point. Yeah, I was out at a fireside chat in San Diego with Qualcomm, great company. And the chief marketing officer, Don McGuire, and I have gotten close. He keeps flying me in because their whole motto at Qualcomm is connectivity. And so he'd fly me in, he'd say, okay, my people haven't seen each other in two years and I want to blow everything up. I want to disrupt. I want to go big. How do you do that? I said, okay, to, you know, to go fast, you got to go slow. We've got to work on connection and build those connections. And so, and so anyhow, after all of these different big idea summits and we got everybody together and, and once you intentionally embed the time to know and hear each other's stories, there's very little room for judgment and then take, you know, assessments and, and personality and leadership profiles and, and grow together and then align strategically with the organization. Then we had this fireside chat. And at the very end of this fireside chat with his entire division, one of his people said, okay, this is all great. And I want to connect with my people. I have no idea if I'm doing a good job. We do in an annual, an annual engagement survey, but it doesn't ask about connection. How do I know? And that's when I realized, Steve, that I, I need to put together an assessment, a quick little, you know, four or five question that you can share with your team. How am I doing? Do you feel seen, heard, valued, appreciated. That to me is connection. It And it, it was hard to do before. And it's even harder nowadays with, with things being so remote, but you kind of hit on something there that, that I find is a real important part of leadership as we, as we lead into that is that vulnerability. Not everyone has that willingness to put some, to put themselves out there like that and be that vulnerable to ask the people on their team, how am I doing? Yes, I agree. And, and as an executive coach, Whenever I begin working with a client, you know, we conduct a 360 and a stakeholder analysis and I interview the people above, below, across. And so we get an idea of how others perceive the, the leadership style, whether it's effective. And then we come up with goals. What do you want to work on this year? And so I think what we need to do is make sure we have measurement in place. So if one of your goals, it should be every leader's goal. I want to connect meaningfully with my team because guess what? In order to increase revenue by 30%, you need to connect meaningfully with your team. You need to build trust. You need to build psychological safety. So then at the end of the year, you can go back and ask your people, how well did we do? And, and you're right, Steve, uh, that, that does take a lot of vulnerability to say, how am I doing connecting with you? Maybe you make it a team focus. You know, I want, as the leader, I want this team to feel connected. And so we're going to work on it. We're going to be intentional about it. For the first five minutes of our one-on-ones, we're going to have coffee together together and talk about family vacations. And that's okay. Cause that's how you connect. Right. And then at the end of the year together as a team, we ask each other, how did we do? I'd like you to give a little bit more context to where your 
backstory is in terms of leadership, because I, I think it's a shared uh, interest we have in this topic of leadership. And mine came from somewhat of an epiphany. We were talking about this a little bit before we hit record on this. And I'm going to ask you to explain yours in a minute. For me, uh, about six, seven years ago, I stepped away from practicing and became a, a full-time practice management consultant, which puts you in a position of hearing a lot of people talk about a lot of the issues that they're having with their practice. So you're hearing things like revenues are declining, employees are not motivated, we're not reaching our goals. And it took me a while to connect the dots. But once it did, it became painfully obvious that it wasn't so much a revenue problem or a staffing problem as much as a, a leadership problem, that nobody was actually in charge. Nobody was driving the, the growth, developing the employees, managing expectations. And if there was somebody in that role, they weren't always effective at it. And many times they were actually making things worse. And I realized that a lot of these practices, what they need, they need better leadership. So that's where that that was my experience and background with with that realization of how important leadership is within an organization and what happens when there's a leadership void. In the book, you talk a little bit about your background and that that moment for you. What what was it in your background that led you to better understand the importance of this topic? Well, I love your story. You are so right. You went in with this with this bias almost like, okay, I'm here to help, you know, increase revenue and increase customer base. And holy smokes, this is much more about leadership. If, if you want to increase your financials, then first work on your team of people and make sure that they know where you're going, right? And you have um, shared values, all of those things. So my big um, start in, in my, what you can call kind of obsession with meaningful connection, it stemmed from insecurity. So I was the, I was a young business school professor. So the only professor teaching the soft skills, you know, business communication leadership surrounded by my colleagues who I thought were just gods teaching finance and economics and, and accounting. And so I wanted, I had to publish or perish. And so I had to publish and I wanted to prove because I was insecure. I wanted to prove that soft skills matter. And I went out and collected data with my colleague, Dr. Kendra Reed, and our research question, I mean, our hypothesis was, of course, if you create a, an environment, if a leader creates an environment where people feel like they can speak up, that they're seen, that they're heard, that the leader's listening to their opinions and actually acting on it, and they're making a difference, if you can create that environment, we called it the team listening environment, then you will have improved financial performance. And we went and collected all of this data at manufacturing facilities across the United States, and we found, yes, it is true. If an employee feels that they have a leader who asks their opinions and sees them, um, then they make more money. That was the beginning, and then I became an executive coach. And then the reason why I wrote the book, as you just mentioned, Steve, is because in one year, three, I usually have a roster of 18 to 20 executives that I coach. Three were getting pushed out of organizations because they were that old school command and control. They had a wall up. They didn't have any connection with their people. They didn't have trust. There was no psychological safety. Ergo, there was no innovation. And so these leaders were getting pushed out. And I thought, oh my goodness, those days are over. It is, if you want to achieve meaningful results, it's all about connection. And I realized I just felt like I had to write the book to get the message out. Can you expand on the term for, I, I'm familiar with it because there was a, when I came, when I familiarized myself with the term, I had read something that talked about the number one characteristic of high performing teams. And I've heard you say it twice now, psychological safety for people who aren't familiar with that term. Can you expand on that? Absolutely. So psychological safety, I first discovered it when Google started doing their work. It was Google. Um, I, I forgot yes, the company. Yes, it was yes. them. Huge. And okay. They were, they wanted to know what exactly your question you just asked what differentiates high performing teams from low performing teams at Google. And so they called it Project Aristotle mm -hmm. and they wanted to figure it out. Now, of course, their bias was that it was technical. We want to hire the right engineers. What exactly should the skill set be so that they can lead these high performing teams and had nothing to do with the technical side? It had to do with what was termed psychological safety. How well does a leader build trust with his or her team and build those connections and make it feel safe 
so that people do want to speak up and share their ideas and that they're not fearful that they're going to get embarrassed, shamed, swatted down. One of the leaders that I saw, which is, is not one of the leaders I was coaching who got pushed out of a big company, he would shame people. He was so high strung. He would shame people during the pandemic on Zoom calls if they had a number wrong in their spreadsheet. And, and I ended up conducting a focus group afterwards with some of these people. And Steve, I mean, their health had been affected. They were suffering, you know, un, unbelievable stress and anxiety, and, and they no longer spoke up because of this psychologically unsafe environment. So, so that's what I realized that a lot of these leaders who were subscribing to that old command and control were trying to be perfect. And guess what? I had been one of those. I'm not going to lie to you. Anybody who's a high achiever who like is an achievement junkie, you know, in their mind, whatever perfect is, they, they, they want to get it right. Who do I need to emulate? You know, who do I need to act like? And so a lot of these leaders were putting up these, these walls. It was like they were marching in trying to be perfect. And, and that's when I realized that perfection equals complete disconnection. And, and so your entire team falls apart. You don't get the results you want and you're not innovative unless you build psychological safety. And when you think of the other side of that, because what I hear a lot is I want my team to contribute. I want a motivated staff, but at the same time, you're not allowing that if you have that more com command and control style. So people are going to be, uh, they're going to cover up their mistakes. They're going to be afraid to contribute, afraid to raise their hand, afraid to be critical. And if, as a leader, you've got to be open to people as we're, where we started this, being able to come to you and not in a fearful way, but be able to, you know, acknowledge or let you know some things that they'd like to see differently from your leadership style. But the leader's got to be willing and to uh, to embrace that. Yes, and I'll give you a good example. One of the um, leaders in my book, Pete November, he's the chief financial officer of Auctioner. And one of his big presentations that he made um, to his people, he really wanted to, to make sure, I think that the strategic goal at the time was to be the most innovative system that delivers health. And I remember being in the audience at their huge leadership event with thousands of people and the CEO of the system standing on stage saying, we will be the most innovative system that delivers health. And like you, as a consultant, I take my job really seriously. So I'm sitting there taking notes going, that's on me. I'm an executive coach. I coach so many of their leaders. How in the world can I help them achieve this innovative culture, right? What does it take? So, so Pete November and I talked a lot about it. And I said, you have to admit right up in front, one of your mistakes to make, to own it, to be vulnerable and say, look, my CEO forgave me. Thank goodness. You need to take those risks too. And we will forgive you. So he gets up on stage at the next big leadership event. And he begins with the story of this brilliant idea he had to have standalone something, something that ended up not making money. They lost $15 million. And he was so vulnerable up on stage. He goes, that was on me. I did that. He said, but thankfully we were able to turn it around and make it into something else. He said, but you have to take the risk in order to make mistakes, in order to be innovative. I think that's what it takes. If that's what you want your team to, to be, what whether it's innovative or whatever you want right now, as a leader, you got to say, look, I've made mistakes too. And, and that may be naturally who you are, but you're afraid to let that side come through. And it kind of leads into my next question. We're, we're stressing connection a lot, which is something I think a lot of times in the world of HR, we we sort of marginalize that human component where you it's easy to get caught up in policies and employee handbooks. You talk about something I thought was really interesting in the book, connecting with yourself, which I thought was really an interesting concept because I have seen repeatedly people promoted to a leadership role and suddenly assume a new persona who's not them. It, they think I, I'm a boss now, so I need to behave this way. And they're not really being true to themselves, which I don't think is sustainable to show up to work every day and be someone who's not me. So how do we find that leadership style that, that doesn't conflict with who we are? And I know that's, that was a key point in the book. You felt like you had to show up to work in a way that you weren't comfortable in your own skin. Can you talk oh, about I that? Put a on a, I put on a great show. Again, it all goes back to insecurity, right? When I was a young professor, again, I, I wanted to be a rock star in the classroom. I wanted to be really great. And, and the role models that I had around me who I did think were rock stars 
looked nothing like me, acted nothing like me. I mean, so I just tried to be them. I tried to be them because I wanted to be successful and I couldn't understand. I mean, this is embarrassing, Steve. It took me a long time to recognize that the reason I wasn't getting their amazing teaching evaluations is because I was trying to be them and I wasn't myself. I just kept saying, you know, beating my head against the wall, but no, 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 they're faculty member of the year and they do these things and I do them too. Why is it not connecting with my students? And so it took me a while. And, you know, you had mentioned earlier high performing teams versus low performing teams. It was a seminal moment, I remember, in my colleague's office, Dr. Kendra Reed, and we were looking at all this research with differentiating characteristics. And one of the research papers I was reading, it said, having a female on the team leads to higher performance. And, and, and they didn't really know why. They kind of could took stabs at it, like maybe just a diversity pays off, as we all well know. But it was that research finding that I looked at, I said, oh my gosh, maybe I really can be a female. That's, I know that sounds kind of weird, but I wasn't allowing myself to even be feminine. You know, I was trying to be very masculine and it just wasn't working. So yes, what I've learned is that you really have to understand who you are, what your strengths are, what your superpowers are. I was hiding my enthusiasm for my topic. You know, I was covering up that um, that I was a corporate trainer for years and I actually knew how to do the role plays and experiential learning, all the things that I eventually gave myself permission because it's what was necessary in the classroom. Okay, so your question, going back to the listeners today, what can they do to better connect with themselves? You have to spend a lot of time with self-reflection. Like I was just saying, what are your strengths? What are your superpowers? How do you add value? How can you lead? with those strengths, surround yourself by people who compliment you, who may be, you know, I'm not highly detailed. I need a highly detailed person in my life, always on my team to, to build success, right? And so I have all of my clients, whenever I begin working with them, I just had a client fly in from San Francisco and we spent the whole day together and I have them go through, tell me your story. What are your significant life events that made you the type of leader you are today? And when that leader shares those stories with me and, and, and hears him or herself talking out loud, they realize that some of those challenging moments in their lives, they're still stuck. And so this particular leader was still stuck. He was in a very Southern university and he was an immigrant and he didn't feel safe or comfortable at all. So he literally lived by himself for years in college and didn't learn how to connect. So now he's brilliant, a brilliant engineer, and he gets promoted to lead others. And they're telling their boss, this dude doesn't know how to connect. I haven't heard from him in a month. Is he alive? So you, you understand those stories and then you, you change the script. And so those stories probably shouldn't be the ones you keep telling yourself, right? So some people have these outdated scripts. So you have to play catch up. So a lot of that connecting, connecting with yourself, Steve, really is about spending time reflecting and owning your past, owning your challenges, making sure you've learned from those, and then you can put your foot on the accelerator and go forward. There's a few key characteristics that I've found that leaders, effective leaders seem to share. And I find myself a lot of times telling people in leadership positions, you have to do you to a point. I think this is what we're talking about is understanding who you are, being true to yourself. Not every leader is, is the same. There's not one right leadership style. I'm curious your feedback on this. Would you agree, disagree? Am I uh, you know, on the right path here? I, I find that there are, even taking into consideration the differences, a few characteristics that are pretty consistent among people, at least in our profession, in the eye care profession. And a lot of these are either usually the doctor or the, the office manager, a healthy balance of assertiveness and humility. Now, the assertiveness is the ability to give people candid feedback. I, I think if you don't possess that, you might struggle a bit in that role because people might just kind of walk all over you. If you don't have that ability to, to create a mechanism of accountability, to give people candid feedback, 
but too much of that. And you can come on, I think a little bit too strong in a leadership role. Humility, humility helps balance that out. I, for me, humility is the ability to look around the room and realize I don't have all the answers here and I I need my team. And it pushes you to, toward wanting to develop and build and support the people on your team because you know, you need them. And if you don't have that, it's back to command and control, right? So are there a few key characteristics that you've found in leaders that you typically look for? You described the secret sauce. Absolutely. Um, Yes, you need assertiveness and humility. And so when you look on the continuum of assertiveness, the other side is um, you don't want to be passive. You want to be confident and assertive and you don't want to be aggressive. So you're right. So that sweet spot is showing up as a confident, assertive leader. And that humility piece, you're absolutely right. You don't want to be walked all over. However, that humility piece plays into one of the chapters that that I that I had to write. Again, I had to write these chapters that were based on all this interview data when I went and interviewed these 18 amazing leaders. They're the ones who gave me right the characteristics and one of them is acting as a servant leader. And that's when you are confident enough and comfortable enough in your own skin that you can say, "You know what? This org chart with me as the CEO or me as the VP, it really is upside down because me as a leader, it's all about helping you all. Mm-hmm. How can I best support you? How can I develop you? I'm going to lead you to where I think that the, the ship, you know, the direction the ship needs to move in. And I want to do this with shared values. I want to create an environment that's good for you. I want to show you that I care, right? And and it's it's about you. And so I'm, I'm advocating that 80-20 rule. It used to be that eight that leaders thought that they needed to talk 80% of the time and listen 20% of the time. And what the research keeps showing us that when you're in a position of power, your whisper is a shout. Your suggestion is an order. So let's go ahead and you open up your meetings with some sort of connection question, you know, tell me what was the highlight of your, of your vacation. I was just on a team meeting with Pete November. He has me uh, attend his zoom team meetings once a month. And we began with that question. It was so sad, Steve, because so many of the people were like, well, we're at the beach and we all got COVID and we all had to stay inside. It was so sad. I can't believe we're still in these times. Right. However, we could laugh at it. And just that one question in the very beginning, beginning, opens it up. And that's where you can see the giant exhale, like, ah, okay, we are a team. We know each other more than just the spreadsheets I'm about to share to everybody on the Zoom call, right? But my point is bringing up Pete again, is that he he does not speak until the very end. He'll open up with, I care about you. I want to hear about your summer vacays. And and, and then you get down as the chief financial officer, he's got a lot to accomplish, right? But he allows them to go, let's hear updates from everybody. How are you doing? How can I help? And at the very end, then he'll do some speaking because he knows that his suggestion is an order. His whisper is a shout. So I really think it should be more of 80-20 acting more as a servant leader. I couldn't agree more. And there, there's actually research out there showing that once you value, show other people that you value their ideas, as it turns out, they will like your ideas more. As if I'm trying to push my ideas on you, and it's just, it's not logical. It's just the way our weird brains are wired up. But if you are pushing ideas onto somebody else, their brain is going to receive that in a way that they become resistant versus if I actually listen to you and and solicit your ideas, welcome your ideas, value your ideas, that if I come back with maybe a, a, a little bit of a twist on that or something, you're likely to embrace my ideas more. And I think that's really where you kind of close that gap on productivity in an office where you actually start become more action oriented instead of just giving suggestions that people, you know, one of the struggles I hear a lot is uh, a practice owner or someone in a leadership position will try to implement something new in a, in their practice. And they'll say, it just didn't, it didn't last it. We, they did it differently for a week or so and went back to doing it the old way. And you wonder what the reasons are that are for that, but you have to wonder too, is it a situation where they didn't like your ideas or maybe did you present them in a way that made them feel like it was an edict and they kind of fought back and did it for a few days and then went back to their old way. Couldn't agree with you more. We definitely speak the same language. It's so validating to hear that in your years as a consultant to all of these practices that you're seeing the same thing. I'd like to talk about retention for a second, because that's a big topic right now is how do I hang on to you? Know, it's hard enough to find employees, but hanging on to the ones I have, especially the the ones we want to hang on to. 
Uh, you talk about this connection between being a good boss and retention. And can I ask you to contrast that a little bit in, in your words, good boss versus bad boss in, in the in the context you meant it? And I'd really like people to listen to this part closely and try to determine where do I land on that scale? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I just uh, taught a study abroad um, with Loyola in Rome. And so I was in Rome guest lecturing on my book. And so I stand up in front of the classroom and we were talking about this exact topic. And I said, raise your hands. And these are what, 21 year olds. I said, raise your hands. If you remember the dinners at your house and them being negatively affected because one or both of your parents had a bad boss, 90% of them raised their hands and said it affected everything. And how sad is that? And then one of them told the story and she said, I'll never forget when my mom finally gave herself permission to leave that company because of that bad boss. And then joined a company where she was happy and valued and, it, and what a difference it made for our family life. I have another example, that same fireside chat that I referred to earlier out in San Diego with Qualcomm, a woman came up afterwards with tears in her eyes. And she said, I am so grateful that I just joined this company because for two years during the pandemic, I had a boss. We met every week and he never, I was alone in my apartment all by myself. And he never once asked me, how are you doing? She said, I finally gave myself permission to leave and I couldn't be happier. So good boss, bad boss. I think what we're talking about now, Steve, is, is much more about how we show up in the world in order the energy that we as leaders bring into any environment, whether it's Zoom or in person, the energy we bring into the environment affects everyone and everything. And retention is an issue that, that comes up in my Zoom calls every single day. It's not only hard to find good, talented people and attract them, it is hard to retain them because now with this hybrid, like you said, and you're remote, so many people can say, oh, I don't have to go to the office every day so I can work for Amazon. Amazon's a big um, somebody who's, you know, offering really great incentives. So how do you keep your people? You keep them by showing up as a person who cares, by showing up as the good boss. I'll give you a funny story. I was at my daughter's graduation party this past spring, and one of my best friend's husbands came up to me. He goes, well, Michelle, I read your book. I said, oh, Lord. And he said, yeah, it's not good. And I said, why? Talk to me. And he said, because I realized I'm doing everything wrong. I said, what do you mean? I said, and he goes, well, because what I think you're telling me is when my guy, and he, he owns a, a big company, a manufacturing facility, he goes, you're telling me that when my guy came into my office yesterday with this look on his face and his cell phone in his hand, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, did a machine break? Did we lose a big customer? No, no. He comes up to me with his phone and goes, my son just took his first steps. I said, oh, that's awesome. He goes, no, you're, you're telling me that next week I have to remember that his son took his first steps. I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. It is. It, it's the little things though. It's the little things on that topic. I got one more question for you. And it's a problem I probably wouldn't have asked you six months ago. This transition, and I think this this ties in with your book as well, but this transition toward remote working, it's not extremely prevalent in, in eye care, but it's starting to become a thing that, that didn't exist before. There's a lot of positions in an optometry practice where you have to be there to do the job, but we're starting to hear maybe with the billing or some of the more administrative roles, employees now, even in optometry practices, requesting to either work from home or do part of their work from home. And this is obviously something that's much more prevalent in a lot of other industries that you might be exclusively, you might work exclusively remote. How does that change things with, from a leadership standpoint? We're just, you're just talking about Zoom calls. So now a lot of the communication isn't necessarily handled face-to-face -face, and it makes it a bit more challenging to make that connection. But how do you do that? What are some of the, the tools somebody might do who's in a leadership position and doesn't necessarily work at the same office with their team and does have to deal with a lot of what we're doing right now is, is this virtual interaction? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I, for my podcast, I just interviewed Juan Martin, who's in my book. Juan Martin is the global president of Kind Bars, the granola bars, mm -hmm. Kind. And, and on the podcast, I asked that exact same question. Okay, so what are your employees telling you? And how are you 
listening and connecting with them. He said, first, our employees, Mars owns Kind Bars. And so he's based, He's he grew up in Spain and he is based in Manhattan now. And um, he said, so our employees keep telling us that they still want flexibility. So what we're doing now, and it could change tomorrow, he said, is we're saying, okay, if you want to stay home Mondays and Fridays or you know two days, we would like for you to be in the office Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. He said, and we configured our entire office space. He said, I don't even have a door I can close. He said, it is all about when you come in, it's about collaboration. It's about face-to-face. -face. It's about idea generation. He said, and when you're at home, then you can be behind your computer all day and just knock it out. But the whole focus now is trying to capitalize and maximize that face-to-face -face time because employees are still telling us they do want that flexibility. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the hybrid model is probably where a lot of businesses are going to settle on. I think people do like the op opportunity to not have to go to, you know, sit in traffic all day and drive because that has its downside as well. It takes time away from your family, your, your sleep is affected. But at the same time, I think at, at a point, it seemed like the pendulum swung the opposite direction. And a lot of people who were at home, maybe through COVID were saying, I just miss being around people. Totally. Yes. Yes. Well, Thank you so much, Michelle. It, it you know, I, I originally had reached out. I do two podcasts, and the other one's a a short one where I really just ask one question. And going through your book, I somewhat selfishly decided to ask you on this one instead oh. because I had a lot of questions, too many to, to just ask one. So um, this was very valuable. I I know the the audience, which is a lot of doctors, a lot of office managers, are going to find a lot of value to this. And I think in a good way, it, it challenges conventional norms the same way that your friend approached you and said, I'm doing it all wrong. I, I like that feedback when people hear someone like yourself or even I do a few presentations on leadership and they realize, okay, I'm doing this wrong. I need to change. I think that's where people really get the, you know, that seed in their head that, okay, I'm going to need to change some things. And I think your point of it starts with just listening. I mean, just if you just take that one step and just listen more to your team and care about your team, that that's, I think, step one in really building that connection with people. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, the closing remark would be be the boss you always wanted, you know, show up for your people, you know, see them as full human beings. That's what it's about right now. It's about true, meaningful connection. Thank you so much, the listeners for tuning in. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Michelle. Where can people find out more about you? Where can they get your book anywhere else? Website, podcasts, what do you got? Absolutely. My book is called The Seismic Shift in Leadership and it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and wherever books are sold. I'm so grateful. It's an Amazon bestseller, which is really exciting. And you can find all of my, my podcasts Podcasts and all of my appearances on podcasts. Um, and you can buy the book on my website, which is michellekjohnston.com. michellekjohnston.com. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Michelle. And hopefully I'll see you on the speaking circuit here. Oh, I can't I'm wait. That sounds future. great, Steve. Thank you so much. Best of luck to you as well. Thank you. And if uh, thanks for listening. And if you'd like more info about IDOC and how we work with ODs to help grow their practice, you can find out more at IDOC.net. IDOC, IDOC.net. So thank you for listening.